Hi, welcome to today's lecture on authentication, where we try to answer the question, who are you? We're trying to figure out how computers identify who you are. So computer systems need to identify uh, and verify the identity of users. They need to know who it is that they're working with. Uh, and there's a number of reasons for this. Um, you might want to control usage, like who's allowed to use a particular system. Or you might want to control access to files or other information on the system. Um, you can envision a lot of scenarios, because we do it all the time, for wanting to control access to a computer system based on the identity of the person. Overall, my goal is to properly identify who is using the system at that moment. Now there are traditionally three factors of authentication. We just call them the three factors of authentication. The first is what you know. Things that you know that you can answer that would help the computer know, um, ascertain that it's you that it's talking to. The second would be things that you have. And the third would be uh, what you are. So what you know, what you have, and what you are. Now let's look at these three factors of authentication in more detail. So the first, what you know. Uh, traditionally, this would be information that would only be known by the user and that the computer can also verify. So some normal examples of this would be a password. This is the most common instance of a what you know authentication mechanism. Uh, a passphrase, which is something we're going to talk about a bit more later on in this lecture. Uh, a PIN number, that's a classic what you know that's used for the banking industry. And security questions. These are my favorite and also one of the worst kinds of what you know because they're usually biographical information. And, and the trouble is usually biographical information about a person is not something only known by them because a lot of biographical information is public record. But anyway, I digress. So these are all examples of what you know. The second factor of authentication is what you have, which would be like a physical item that the user has on them. So some classic examples here. The first would be a smart card. Now here in Qatar, um, we have smart cards for the ID. Some of you may have the new ones, some of you may not. Um, but the new ones have this smart chip in them. And that chip uh, contains some cryptographic protocols that allow the chip to authenticate um, with a computer. And actually having this card becomes a, an instance of what you have. So you may have seen some of these self-service uh, Ministry of the Interior kiosks scattered around Qatar. Well, if you have one of the new ID cards, you put in the ID card, and that card serves as a proof of who you are just by the fact that you have it with you. Now, they do some additional authentication as well, but that's one instance of a physical thing you might have that you could use to authenticate to a computer. There are some computer systems that will actually let you authenticate with a physical key which is a little bit strange, but sometimes, sometimes you'll see this in military systems. We actually have to insert and turn a physical key in order to, as part of your authentication. And another example is a security token. So what is a security token, you may ask? Well, it's a device that displays a number that changes about every 30 seconds, and it looks something like this. It usually goes on your keychain, and you'll see it's got a six-digit number on it, and every 30 seconds that number changes. And the pattern of the number change is kind of locked away into the hardware. And somewhere on a server side or a computing system, it knows what that number should be at a given time. And so when you would go to log into a system, you might have to give your username and your password and the current number on your security token in order to log in and authenticate properly. Now, this is commonly used for corporate VPNs. That's the place I see it the most. Um, because it adds a level of complexity by adding another factor of authentication. So not only do you need your username and password, which is a what you know, you also need the number off of this key fob, which is a what you have. Uh, you can also get a, a version of this as an app for your phone. So it's an application on your phone that generates this number. And the idea there is that your phone is something that you have. So that serves as, as another factor of authentication. Uh, as a funny uh, anecdote about these, um, they're, they're very effective, actually, as, as an authentication mechanism when combined with other things, uh, but they tend to not get widespread adoption in, in the common usage. So, uh, like, I bank here at QMB, and QMB doesn't offer something like this as a way to authenticate into my bank account. But, uh, but if I was a, a game player, so this is a, a, a security token from a company called Blizzard, and they, they're the ones who produce World of Warcraft and Starcraft and a lot of games like that, um, for $7, they'll sell you a security token to secure your account. So Blizzard takes the security of their accounts very seriously, and so do a lot of their users. So it's easier for me to secure a World of Warcraft character than it is my bank account. I just think that that's funny. So the third factor of authentication is what you are. 
And the key word when we're talking about what you are is biometrics. So biometrics are based on the physical characteristics of the users, aspects of the user uh, that presumably they can't fake to pretend to be someone else. So the classic examples of this are your fingerprints, uh, retina, or iris scan, or retina or iris scans, which is scanning different parts of your eye and taking pictures of that. Uh, your face is surprisingly unique, and that, interestingly, is the biometric that human beings use to authenticate each other. We verify each other's identity primarily by face. Uh, voice is, is another classic one that computers can do, and people do that one as well. And then signature, I put that on here. Computers don't really... Uh, I don't know of any computer systems that use a signature to authenticate you, but that is a traditional way that we've authenticated people in the financial industry for a long time. You sign a check or you sign a statement and your signature should match the one that they have on file. So biometrics are, are a big and growing area. And they're becoming a lot more widely used. Um, even in Qatar here, fingerprints are used for your e-government and your e-gate systems. So if you have that smart card, and you go up to a self-service MOI terminal, it asks you to put your finger down for a fingerprint identification. So at that point, in order to authenticate to that system, you have two factors of authentication that you're using. The what you have, which is your ID card, smart card, and what you are, which is your fingerprint. Uh, many biometrics are very effective because they can't, they don't really change. They're very, very difficult to fake. Some, some are easier to fake than others. Um, and they're not revocable or transferable. So like I can't give my fingerprint to somebody else and let them log in as me, which is good for the system, it might be bad for me. Um, but not revocable means that if something goes wrong, I can never like change my fingerprint. I can't say, oh, well, you know, my, there's a problem with my fingerprints, so I need to change them, you know, just like I would with a password. It's not revocable. And so one issue with not revocable or transferable is you have to think through where you use biometrics and why. So there was a, a classic case in Malaysia where a car thief stole a man's finger. They cut it off of his hand because his car had biometric fingerprint authentication for the starter. So they tried to steal his car and they had him get in the car and use his fingerprint to start it. And then as they were driving away, they realized that unless they had his fingerprint, they wouldn't be able to start the car without him. So they cut off his finger and threw him out of the car because they needed a way to start the car. So that's actually an interesting case because it shows that, okay, that biometric may be convenient. It's convenient to be able to start my car with my fingerprint. But in a theft scenario, if someone puts a gun to my head and says, give me the keys to your car, I want to be able to give them the keys to my car. I don't want to have to say, well, you have to start my car with my fingerprint and I can't give you that. The whole thing just becomes awkward. So that's a scenario where biometrics were not applied wisely, let's say. And that's actually, that, that issue right there, which happened in 2005, is probably the primary reason that we don't see more widespread use of biometrics in automobiles. Okay, so when we talk about authentication, um, usually involving more factors of authentication increases security and the effectiveness of that authentication scheme. So when we discuss how many factors a system uses, we say some number factor authentication. So if I have a system that only requires one of the three factors, I would say it's single or one factor authentication. If I need two of the three, I'd say two factor. Or if I need all three in order to authenticate, I'd say three factor authentication. So as an example, if I have a system that requires a password and a fingerprint in order for me to log in, then I could call that two factor authentication. Because first it requires a password, which is an instance of what I know, and second, it requires a fingerprint, which is an instance of what I am. So I have those two factors, so I call that two-factor authentication. And that's some wording that you'll see sometimes on sales brochures and things like that for systems. They'll tell you, oh, we have two or three-factor authentication. Um, but I wanna stress here that when you're talking about this, you, you should only count unique factors of authentication. So as an example, uh, requiring a password and a security question is still only one factor because a password is a what you know, and a security question is what you know. So that's still one or single factor authentication. But if I require a password in say a code from an SMS that's sent to my phone, well then you could call that two factor because the password is something that I know and the SMS sent to my phone is something that I have because I have the phone. It means a sense of what you know and what you have. So. It, Three-factor authentication would be a case where you would have something that you know, something that you have, and something that you are. 
And you're never going to have more than three factors of authentication for a system because there's only three factors. So this is just an important distinction to see when describing it. I've actually seen uh, people try to advertise their systems and say, we use five-factor authentication. You can't use five-factor authentication. There's only three factors. What they really have is multiple instances of the same factor, which, which usually uh, is not a huge boost to security, but sometimes in minor ways it can be. So let's summarize this discussion of authentication. Uh, there are three types of authentication, three factors, what you know, what you have, and what you are. And in general, more unique factors of authentication is better to have. Um, so the more unique factors you have in general, the better that authentication system is. But it usually comes at a cost of usability um, or sometimes practicality. So that's all for today for authentication.